Okay, this is an introductory talk on security for computers and mostly going to talk about network security and public key, private key. Okay, so first thing we need to know is about Unix file permissions. And every file has bunch of permissions associated with it. First of all, the file has an owner and that owner belongs to a group or multiple groups. So this file test is owned by Walbert, the user Walbert and the group is support. These are the, uh, the, the, the users and the groups of the file and the permissions. The permissions are like in three groups. The user, what permission the user has, what permission the group has and what permission everybody else has. Okay, So the, the user has three different kinds of permissions, read, write and execute. If the X is not there, you cannot run it as a program, it's just a file, text file and you need to have read write permission and if you're not the owner of the file, if you're a member of the group and a group has a read permission, you can read that file also. So anyone in the group support can read this file or execute the file but they cannot write it and everybody else has no rights, dash means no, dash means zero and uh, one otherwise it means a one like rwx. So in octal it would be zero, two and four so that would get six in octal so it's seven 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 means rwx 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 and the command to change it is ch mode and user group or others and read write execute and you can give minus r for recursive and which files to change the other things about to note about the file with the ls minus long option is the number of hard links how many pe how many other people are linking to this file was the file size and was the type of the file. So types of the file, other types are the, uh, it's a directory and in olden times they also had this text file which was like shared file and also SUID file. Basically you get the person who runs it, if there's a S set out here, the person who runs it gets the same rights as you, the owner of the file. So if a root owns the file, uh, uh, change password file and if you run change password you get the same rights as change password and change password can actually change your password but you can't directly change your password ok that's about unix files so windows files is slightly more complicated but it never seems to work right and there are lots of kinds of ACLs and ACLs are basically access control list there's a allow deny the default allow deny this is and the distribution in ACLs okay so and uh, and ev every user is given a SID every object everything is given a SID it's a security ID which is a unique uh, long number with many dashes in it and you can get get SID put SID to see the numbers and then your group also has SID and then the you have the owner for a file and it and the default ACL okay so if you need to know more and the way to change Unix uh, Windows permission is to use the, the either the Explorer UI so these are the groups and users out of out the this object the F colon 80 this is the object so basically in Windows everything has permissions including pipes and uh, objects uh, handles in the operating system and files and directories and anything else that is a handle. So first, the, the, you can see the kind of things they have: uh, authenticated users, systems, administrator, and users. So the user is basically composed of the username, username, and the domain it belongs to. In this case, it's a computer name. You pick a user, then you give him all these controls: full control, modify, read, execute, list contents, read. So this is a really hodgepodge of permissions. It never really, it's not really well defined, and things work sometimes they don't work. And generally, if you are the owner of the file, you have full permission on it. And sometimes it gets messed up when you copy files around from one system to another system. And generally, as a user, if you say own files, you need to be admin on the box. There's no point being not an admin because there are like millions of backdoors on Windows, and everyone else is an admin. So why not you? And avoid the headache of file system permissions and these are the access masks for it like read write execute generic read write system security delete and all these kinds of rights are there but some of them are really funny in the sense that like you can back up a file but you can read a file 
and then you could always back up and, and if you can't read the USB drive you plug in another computer you can read the drive so yeah it's not very consistent and it's not very helpful either but there are many commands like copy ACLs I C A C L S and I C and commands on win on Windows from the command line or the PowerShell you can use to change its bits usually you only need to change it when you want to uh, deny something but uh, just remember that even if you don't allow anyone to read the file they can always use some other mount your file in some NTFS on Linux or something and read your files anyway so the best real option is to actually make sure that no one gets access to your file is to encrypt your file or not leave your files around or hard disk around even if your windows is locked people can get, get to your files so that's about the windows security the next thing we will look at is some of the problems that we have on programs okay first most common problem we hear about is the buffer overflow what is the buffer overflow basically a process attempts to write data beyond the boundaries of the buffer has been allocated so what happens in this case is that the data the, the process rise into some adjacent memory locations usually the program will crash or it will get some corrupt wrong data okay so most of the time uh, if you're not very careful like ABR you see in access array bound read or write ABW in uh, this, uh, this uh, memory checkers they will tell you that the program is being badly but sometimes people do it deliberately to write into specific locations and locations could be a username or a password they can just delete it or read it without you knowing about it okay so that's buffer overflow and it's used by people when they don't check where they're writing or they're writing more data than is actually supposed to be written so and it causes a lot of security issues example would be a very long username or a very long password and it's beyond the limit of the program that's reading in the username and the username actually writes into the surrounding buffer and then it takes over the system by because system it may write into something else and then system doesn't know it overwrote into something else and maybe it give you the rights to do admin rights and that's how people get admin rights and the way around is to, to do bounce checking basically check that everything that comes in from a user is basically or the fixed size and only the allowed characters are typed in by the user and compiler can also check runtime checks to pre pre uh, prevent buffer overflows okay the next thing to know about is passwords when you're saving usernames and passwords in your database or online site remember anybody else the sysadmin can log into your computer and look at everything so you don't want to save passwords of other people onto your computers computers get hacked and yahoo lost all his passwords and linkedin lost all his passwords so like 500 million usernames were exposed so how do you get around it you don't you don't actually save the password but you save the, the hash password suppose your username is apple and the password is apple xyz then you hash the password into uh, using SSH or md5 older times and now SSH 256 or 512 you can use and then that's called a hashing algorithm and then and not only that you can also add a salt to it so that like salt is some two characters at, at the end you add so that anyone who has a dictionary of all the words uh, is not able to build a dictionary uh, predefined dictionary of all the words and all the hashes so salt is some random number added and whenever it types in a password you take it a random number and add to the password and then compute the hash again the idea is you only save the hash and given the hash you can't find the password but given the password you can find the hash easily so then if somebody steals the hashes you d they don't really get anything but uh, they will have to spend a lot of time to figure out the hashes and username of course you need to keep it open otherwise you don't know what to look under and and the thing is so this is this can be stolen but nobody can use it to log in another thing to prevent is to uh, allow only users to try twice or thrice a day so that if they try more times they'll get blocked for a day so people can mount brute force attacks on knowing the hash also you may try to build something called rainbow tables which has all the hashes in the world but for S uh, for md5 they managed to build it but for SHA 512 uh, and stuff it's beyond the range of computers to build that kind of a table ok so that's how you save passwords so beyond that the second thing is that even if you save it you don't want to save the same question answer every time 
if you ask what's your password, what's the thing, somebody is listening in the middle can just record everything and repeat. So what I do is they use something called challenge response. So you want to type in, you type in your username, username goes to the server. This is from NTLM, Windows LAN Manager. And the server basically says, okay, here's a username, but so we'll generate a random number and give it to you as a challenge. And then this guy will compute a ch use your password to compute something and send it back. So the thing is, if somebody is listening, they won't get the same challenge every time. So they can't really reply the same answer. If somebody asking you a question, okay, something about specific, and you answer it, but next time somebody listens to it and it tries to copy you, they won't be asked the same question by the server, the challenge. So the challenge will be different every time. So anyone who's copying the responses won't be able to reuse your response. And then it goes to the domain controller which verifies the challenge response and sends back OK or not OK. So challenge response uh, it saves you against replay attacks. And then what is the next thing that people attacked on? It's like they use something called two-factor authentication. So two-factor uh, is more secure than just typing in a password or something. Is it is something you know and something you have. So what you know is your password, what you know is your username, and what you have is your phone or your finger or your eyes. So they can form your second authentication in the sense that like after you log in with your password, it'll ask you it'll send you SMS. So it make sure that you actually have a phone with a number registered phone so that both are actually needed to log in. So that's a good way of preventing attacks. In the olden days, they had uh, OTPs, like a, uh, like a hardware gen generator, but nowadays we just use phones, uh, smartphones to generate these numbers, SMS. So then there's a multi-factor authentication in which something you know, which is a question about your, like, what's your school, high school name or something, your password, and your biometrics, like your fingerprint or something. And the olden days, this was the OTP generator, like the RSA OTP generator, which just printed random numbers in a secure way, and it will be time synchronized with the server, so that whatever number is printed out here is the same number in the server. So only you know this number, and the server knows this number, and you physically own this, so you don't lose it. And at this point, and you can open it and find out what the next number will be at what time. So it changes every second or every 10 seconds. So you need this number and your password to compute something and you never transmit your password you compute you send some combination of your name and password hashed so that the server does the same thing and the network never gets to see your real password okay so what's the web login how does the web login work and you only log in once you don't log in multiple times how does it work and the thing is in client server the client is independent of the server you may be disconnected and you continue after like two minutes do you need to log in again or the same login works? How does the same login work? So suppose you are logged on Gmail and after two minutes you send the next request. How does Gmail know? It's still you, not somebody else. You change your Wi-Fi location or something. So what did the web server does is it gives you a cookie. Cookie is like a temporary pass. So when you try to log in, it sends you to login server, SSO server, single sign-on server and their parlance and then you send in a username and password and some banks will also hash your password so that you can't save it into the browser so the next user and then the server will authenticate you and give you a cookie or nouns or something which is a random number which is valid encrypted number which is valid for a few seconds like for example gmail will send you to youtube with a nouns and then youtube will log you in immediately after a few seconds that, that nouns will expire but you're logged into gmail using that nouns and then you're back to the gmail server and then there's a cookie that is saved in your browser. The cookie is basically encrypted which includes your the current time expiry t and expiry date and the IP address and your username. So it can be copied by somebody else and use it on another computer or by SS admin unless they have the same computer and the same username and the same IP address. And after a few minutes or uh, whatever the expiry time of the cookies it will expire and the browser. So if you have a uh, Chrome browser and if you try to copy in the IE it will not work it should not work it depends on how they implement the cookie so the cookie every time you make a request you send a cookie with it saying hey here's my pass and then server will check the cookie and if cookie is valid it will respond properly so what's an excess attack 
uh, XS stands for cross site scripting. It's a code injection that allows the att attacker to execute JavaScript in your browser. It's somebody else's JavaScript, it's not the website JavaScript. And JavaScript has access to everything that that is in your browser, such as your cookies. Okay? And JavaScript can send an HTTP request to any other site with any other content by using X, XML HTTP request. And then JavaScript can also modify HTML in any way it wants on your current page by using DOM manipulation. So how does it work? Basically, in a, you have a comment field in some websites and instead, instead of a text comment, you actually type in the JavaScript in that thing. And what happens? Let's, we'll see some examples later. So the, what is a malicious JavaScript? What can it do? First thing you can do is steal your cookies. So if you, somebody uh, put in JavaScript, it can send your cookie to another site and then that guy can use your cookie to, to buy stuff or delete stuff. Second one is the JavaScript can actually register keyboard events and listen to everything that you type in to your computer, such as the passwords and credit card numbers. Third one is phishing attacks, where what they do is they insert a fake login form using DOM manipulation on your web page and then ask you to type something in and they collect the data it goes to some other site it doesn't really go to the site that's listed on your url so how does it work so on the attacker uses one of the website forms to insert malicious string into the website database and then when you get that page from the website it includes the malicious string and then your browser executes that string and it sends your cookie cookies to the attacker 